You're listening to WSTU Stewart. This is WPSL Fort St. Lucie. The opinions on this program are those of the program host and guest and not necessarily those of WPSL. WPSL does not endorse products that may be mentioned. Any reproduction or retransmission of this broadcast is strictly prohibited without written consent of WPSL. Legal questions? Ask a lawyer. Give us a call at 340-1590. 340-1590 here at the studios of WPSL. And Ask a Lawyer with your host, Attorney Stuart M. Address. Good morning. This is Stuart Address for Ask a Lawyer. It's September 3rd, 2021. We are now in September. Oh, it's the home stretch. And uh, we've had an interesting week in the office. Um, if you consider the den in my the desk in my den, my office, which is where I am most of the time, we've been working on overtime cases. We've been working on a case where we have uh, two partners uh, in several franchises of a national food chain that are fighting with each other and need to work up, get a business divorce. And uh, uh, we've been dealing with a number of other things coming up, including uh, one lawyer filing a bar grievance against another lawyer. So it's been a slightly hectic week. But it's, it's not been a hectic week just for me. It's been another hectic week in the schools with masks and viruses and quarantines and, oh, the biggie, the biggie. If you were listening last Friday, you'll remember I said that even while I was speaking at that moment, between 10 and 11, a judge could be issuing an order in the school masking case against the governor and the Department of Education. Well, guess what? By now you probably know that when I got off air, and I did a quick little Google search, I was right. While I was on air, the judge had issued an order. Well, he hadn't actually issued an order. What he had done was speak from his notes for two hours in explaining the order that he was going to write. And that was going to overrule the governor's executive order, which provided that school districts could only issue mask mandates if there was a parental opt-out. And he spoke for two hours explaining why the governor was without constitutional authority to issue such an executive order. The judge then took until yesterday afternoon at 3.49 p.m. until a 25-page written order was actually entered in the record, which implemented the injunction. So, as of Monday, what's going to happen? Well, I suspect that by Monday there'll be an appeal, which will stay the order, temporarily put it on hold until an appellate judge can determine whether the stay should remain in effect while the appeal goes through the process or whether the injunction should go into effect while the appeal goes through the process. If the injunction stays into effect, then the executive order is history. If the injunction is stayed, then the governor can continue to do whatever he wants until an appellate court determines otherwise. So before we actually discuss that, that order, that carefully crafted order, let's look quickly at some of the newer statistics. And let's look thought, at you know, when you said the important stuff, I thought you were going to say that our WPSL High school football game of the week was canceled due to COVID at Jensen Beach. Come to find out a couple hours after that, 
South Fork, Martin County, both quarantined. So all three Martin County high school football teams are quarantined this week. So all three Martin County football teams quarantined can't compete because of COVID. Are we surprised? I'm shocked. I know. Couldn't, couldn't possibly be anticipated. So let's look at just, let's look at our five local school districts, semi-local, South Florida, and the one who really, really stuck it to the governor over there in Hillsborough. Now, starting with Miami-Dade, as of yesterday, the statistics were 227 individuals with COVID, 153 students, and 74 staff. Now, that is compared, that 227 is compared with the number I gave you last Friday, which was 105. It's more than double in one week. Broward County, as of yesterday's numbers, 647 with COVID, 418 students, and 229 staff. As compared to the numbers I mentioned last Friday, which was 84 students, not 418, and 68 employees, not 229. Uh, that is a massive increase in a week. Now, those two were the hot zones uh, the first time around. You're right. Those two were the hot zones the first time around. We'll jump over to Hillsborough County, third largest school district in Florida, Miami-Dade, Broward being number one and two. Hillsborough, as of yesterday, 7,000. 387 COVID infections, comprising 2,000, I'm sorry, 6,218 students and 1,169 staff. How does that compare to the numbers I gave on the radio last Friday? Well, the total again is 7,387 as of yesterday. As of last Friday, it was 4,989. So we have an increase of roughly 2,400. And I'd say that's a 50% increase over the 4,900 of the week before. And we will pause for a moment because we have Carlos on line one. Hello, Carlos. Hey, uh, I, just, I just got a few questions for you. Sure. When I, when I... When I when I listen to Fauci, he says that these masks that we're wearing have a zero percent. I, I can't, Carlos, I can't really hear you. We're really having trouble hearing you, Carlos. Speak up. Okay. When I when I listen to Fauci, when I listen to Fauci, they said that these masks that we're wearing are zero percent. Okay. I heard, when you listen to Fauci, the masks that we're wearing are zero percent uh, protection against this uh, COVID disease. And you keep on bringing these numbers of how many people got COVID. Well, how many people have died from this? And how many people have survived it? I think it's like a 99% survival. Uh, Who cares if it's a 99% survival? Over 600,000 <laughs> Americans have died of COVID. Well, Who cares if 99% survive? Well, why are you screaming? Why are you screaming? We're having a discussion. More people die of the flu every year than they died of That's not true. That is not true that more people die of the flu. That's the fight I had with my rabbi from the very beginning in March of 2020. That's baloney. That's hogwash. And those paper, and those paper masks that you are telling our kids to wear so they can't breathe oxygen have a zero percent. The politics can get zero percent protection against the, the COVID disease. Zero. Really? Zero percent. Zero percent. Effective against COVID. I, 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 I'm sorry. You know, I, I appreciate your calling. I really do. But, you know, I, I think you're smoking some crack. <laughs> I think we just lost him. Okay. I, I think so. You know, I, folks, if you've listened to this show for almost four years, you know, I don't really insult the callers. I really don't. 
But if you're going to tell me that 600,000 Americans dying is insignificant because 99% survive, and by the way, that's not a correct figure, it's roughly 96.5%. So let's at least be accurate. But I did not stay in my house for over a year because 96 plus percent survived. I stayed in my house for over a year and I'm essentially back for the most part to my house because of that three and a half percent that died. And because of that three and a half percent, I'm the target audience. I'm over 60, I'm way overweight. I have diabetes and I have a couple other conditions. I'm not walking around and, and waiting for that little funny molecule that has all these red things around it to find me. So I'm sorry if I get a little agitated at a call like that. It's my life on the line. It's my family's life on the line. And every member of my family, except me, has had COVID. I guess maybe I've been a little bit more careful with all due respect to my family. Uh, maybe a little bit lucky too but a little bit more careful. And so don't tell me masks don't work. You know, that's, that's hogwash. And uh, the numbers are the numbers. So let's now look at good old Palm Beach County, fifth largest school district in Florida. Numbers based upon yesterday, 3,907 COVID infections of which 3,395 were students and 512 staff. How does that compare to last Friday? Well, last Friday, instead of it being 3,395, it was 2,031. Again, almost a 50% increase just this week alone. Now, are those coincidences? Are those numbers that are, you know, being manipulated? Uh, I guess if you believe in government conspiracies, maybe. Um, in Martin County, as of yesterday, 419 total infections in, in schools, by the way. 353 of them are students and 66 staff. The numbers this week alone, 115 students and 17 staff. Overall in Martin County schools, 3,727 are in quarantine. Now, why don't I tell you the quarantine numbers of the other counties? Because of the governor, there is no single repository of these statistics any longer. Because of the governor, each local school district has left it up, well, it has been had it left to themselves to create a dashboard to put out these numbers. And there are only some of them who include in the numbers the quarantine numbers. By the way, uh, St. Louis County. More scary. Yeah, yeah, St. Lucie County. Uh, so I'm about yeah. to go to right now. Go on. Yeah, well, St. Lucie County Health Department will begin its. Uh, COVID uh, weekly updates on WPSL uh, twice a Friday at 3.05 and 6.05 in the afternoon. So uh, we'll have updates from the health department, just like we did during the first go around uh, beginning today at 3.05. And for those on Facebook, I'll repeat what Greg said in the studio, uh, the St. Lucie County Department of Health is going to be issuing uh, COVID statistical updates twice a week on Friday, starting today at 3.05 and 6.05 p.m. So you can listen to those here on WPSL. But now let's look at the St. Lucie school statistics, of course, of particular interest, perhaps to most of us and to me, who is still sending my son uh, to his senior year at Lincoln Park Academy. Uh, and then on two days a week, uh, I pick him up at the bus stop and take him straight to IRSC for his classes there. Um, so 
interacting within the school zone quite a bit. Um, and he does wear his mask, I, I, I see it. But anyway, as of yesterday, St. Lucie County, 922 total COVID infections, 724 of which are students, 198 staff. Now, how did that number compare to last Friday? Well, gee. One third of that 922 was this week. And on August 27th alone, let me count backwards. I think that's last Friday. Last Friday when we were on the air. Last Friday, the entire district, 313 COVID infections. That's one third. But you remember I told you that I was a little bit unhappy that my, my son's school, Lincoln Park Academy, was number three in the St. Lucie County School District with infections. Well, I guess I'm proud to say it's dropped down to number eight. Unfortunately, that's not good news for a whole bunch of other people. Let's break down the top 10, which probably should be referred to as the least 10, because they're the schools that you least want your kids to be in right now. Number one, St. Lucie West High School. I'm sorry, St. Lucie West K-8, 59 infections. Ooh, that's a shocker. Okay. Number two, Treasure Coast High School, 58. Number three, Oak Hammock, 55. Number four, Fort Pierce Westwood, which was number two last week, 51. Number five, Centennial. 45. Number six, Northport K to eight, 44. And before I give you the last two, let's keep in mind when we're talking about St. Lucie West K to eight, which is number one, when we're talking about Oak Hammock, which is number three, and we're talking about Northport, which is number six, or oh, there's actually more than two more. We're talking about kids who can't get the vaccine right now. The only protection for them is masks. Now, hopefully soon, kids five and over will be able to get the vaccine, but not quite yet. Number seven. Allopata Flats, K-8, 41. Number eight, Lincoln Park Academy, as I had mentioned, and uh, it's now at 40. Last Friday when I spoke to you, it was at 25. That's a two thirds increase in one week. Tied for nine. So in ninth and 10th places, with 38 each, Manatee and Palm Point. Again, schools where the kids, most of them cannot get the vaccine, even if the parents wanted them to. Do they have stats uh, from the school district and how many of the high school students are unvaccinated? Uh, I don't know if they do. It's not on the dashboard. Um, and so I don't know if those statistics are kept or if those statistics are made public. Yeah, I'll have to. Well, that may be the HIPAA thing. Uh, that's possible, too. Well, I don't think it's HIPAA because you're not digging. You're not drilling down to the individual student. You're, you're giving a gross number. So, for example, a private employer, I, I've encountered this many, many times. 
a private employer tells you, you need to go into quarantine because somebody in your department has COVID or is known to have been around somebody with COVID. They cannot tell you who. So you don't know precisely how close of a contact were you with this person? That's HIPAA. They, have, they can tell you, and in, in my regard, under the law, they must tell you if you've been in proximity with such a person. Because not to tell you puts your own health at risk, and then the risk of other people with whom you're going to continue to associate. And that's how we get a plague or a pandemic, as they like to call it these days. So, you know, these numbers, particularly just looking at St. Lucie and drilling down into the top 10, these numbers are all going up dramatically in one week. The top 10 is sort of juggling significantly within one week. Why is that? Well, because it tends to, when you get a cluster, the numbers really go up because that person infects that person who infects that person who infects that person, regardless of our, our earlier caller. Um, respectfully, I do submit that the masks are necessary and beneficial. We've heard this from good old Dr. Fauci. We've heard this from the director of the CDC. We've heard this from the head of NIH, National Institutes of Health. We've heard this from the Surgeon General. We've, we've heard it from virtually all the competent, reliable doctors, the overwhelming vast majority. Yes, there are a few that are still failing you to take you know, horse drugs, but I guess um, there will always be doctors Trump out there somewhere. The reality is, absent the vaccine, the masks are our best defense. And again, not only are they our defense, they're our defense to protecting others, they're our defense to receiving, and they're our defense to, if we do receive and have no symptoms, giving it to others without knowing. This is how you stop a pandemic. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say to you, you know, Sometimes I deviate from these legal issues, but we're about to go into the court decision. So I feel that there's some connection here to law. I ask you to ask yourselves in your heart of hearts, do you think when we had, when we had the bubonic plague, when we had chicken pox, did anybody divide among Democrat or Republican? Or was everybody on board with getting rid of this thing? Yeah, okay. I'm sure there were a few. But I, I, I'm going to guess that 99% just wanted to get rid of the thing. That there wasn't this hard 30% that was anti-vax for whatever their reasons. Most of them absurd. Now, do I believe that within that 30%, there are some people who have legitimate, reasonable bases for their concern? Yes, absolutely, I believe. There are people out there that have, in their analysis and in their internal decision-making, have legitimate, reasonable explanations for why they don't want to take it. I mean, I don't know, maybe some of them are, well, you know, we hear about so many horrible effects of drugs 10 years later, you know, I want to wait a little bit longer. I understand that. I don't agree with it in this circumstance, but I understand it. God knows every day we're hearing something else causes cancer. We all know about tons of product liability lawsuits, but products who later on were found to be really, really harmful in some way. I understand things like that, but in the face of virtually everybody who doesn't have a vaccine likely is going to get COVID at some point and risk their own death, 
in light of that, I would say, man, whatever your explanation is, uh, in, in this situation, it, it's not reasonable because the prospect of death should override the reasonable thought process that you're having. And then most of that 30%, well, they're sheep. I'm sorry. I know I, know I have a, a Republican leaning audience, but they're just following somebody over a cliff. And at some point, somebody's going to stop. You know, even when we had these cults, Jonestown, at some point, there were certain people that said, no, no, no more. I'm not doing this. Oh, we need a few more that say, no, no, not more. I'm not doing this. All right. Now, I mentioned we had a court decision last Friday. And um, as I mentioned, uh, my prediction on the air last Friday that a decision might be coming down while I was speaking was correct. You know, I'd like to think that I was correct because after 36 years of being a lawyer, I've learned how to assess a case and causes of action. Some of it could have been dumb luck. Now, the primary issue that I perceived that was problematic with Governor DeSantis's executive order, other than it being sheerly stupid, but the primary legal issue that I perceived was a constitutional one. Florida's constitution provides the right for all students to a safe and healthy public school education. Now, it's interesting, Governor DeSantis looked at that provision and interpreted it precisely the opposite way. And that's why there are lawyers in court battles. Governor DeSantis looked at that and said, well, gee, everybody is entitled to a safe and healthy public school education. And who's the best person to make a decision for their child? Their parents. And so therefore, if so facto, parents have a constitutional right to opt out. Isn't so, it kind of simple when you look at the governor's... Uh... Um, edict, I guess, if you will. Yeah, it was um, an edict. Is it, isn't he in violation of the home rule concept in the state of Florida? Oh, you're such a smarty pants. Yes, he, he is in violation of the home rule part of the Constitution, as we will discuss. Greg, you're just showing off now, I'm telling you. It just and seems I, obvious, that's all. It just well, I'm, I'm glad you think it's obvious, because obviously it wasn't obvious to so many people, including the governor. So, you know, there was a conflict that the governor sort of overlooked in his interpretation of that provision, and, and my interpretation, and the interpretation of the plaintiffs. And that is, while you as a parent in general, are certainly the best position to provide and to dictate what is best for your own child. And therefore, let's say, tell them not to wear a mask. By doing so, you are inflicting very reasonable danger upon all else in that school. And therefore, there is a real conflict in the public interest. If you exercise your right to quote unquote protect or provide for the safety of your child, you are destroying the rights of all those other parents who say, my kid should be masked and um, everybody should be wearing masks to make sure that everybody is protecting everybody. This is not a situation where you make a decision and the only impact if you're wrong is on your own child. Here, you could quarantine an entire classroom 
In some instances, you can close an entire school. And, and that's where the governor either just didn't perceive it correctly, or I'm going to submit to you because I'm so jaded, I'm so tarnished, I'm so cynical. The governor knew exactly what he was doing, but he wants to be president and he wants to be like Trump. And he's going over the cliff no matter what, because I'm telling you, he's running for re-election as governor in 2022 before he tries to be president in 2024. If he loses as governor, his career is done. He's not running for president in 2024. And even though we have a slightly leaning Republican state, there are a lot of Republicans who aren't quite happy with these types of decisions, certainly independents. And so he may be losing um, a lot of his own base by doing what he's doing, even while he secures it with most of his base. I'm very tarnished. I believe this is a political decision. And in fact, the judge in his 25 page opinion discussed the issue of a political question because this is not so outlandish and cynical, you know, that even a court doesn't evaluate the issue of political question and whether it is a political question and therefore so the governor has the sole right to make the decision because the courts cannot get involved in political questions. All right, so 25 page order, hundreds of pages of exhibits. Now I'll be honest with you, I didn't read the 100 pages of exhibits. I did read the 25 page order. And see, that puts me in a classification that is probably the top 1%. You know, I don't usually say I'm in the top 1% in anything, but maybe I am. And having read the 25 page order. You're probably the only one in the whole state who's read it. <laughs> and, 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 and what, what the purpose of that is you all, to the extent you have any knowledge of what happened because of the news, whether it's WPSL or the old fashioned newspaper, print or online, or CNN or Fox or the local West Palm affiliates of the networks, whatever your source of knowledge it is probably limited to an article or two or a one minute news soundbite where reporters do their best to summarize complex legal issues. So what I'm saying is what you have heard and what you understand is at level one of analysis, not let's say level 10. And when you go through that deeper analysis, Sometimes your opinion might be changed. Example in point, and I won't go through all the details because I've done it on other shows, the McDonald's hot coffee case, which lawyers love to use in voir dire these days in questioning prospective jurors. Most people would say, millions of dollars for a hot cup of hot coffee? What a, a, a crazy? So I, I guess if that's all I knew, I tend to agree. But when you learn that the coffee maker was, you know, like 15 degrees too hot for the human body, that it was capable of causing third degree burns, that McDonald's knew about it in advance, that McDonald's internally did a study and determined it would take a couple dollars each to fix the coffee makers worldwide. And then they decided, ah, eh, it's probably more expensive than the cost of litigation. So let's just risk it. Then most people who have been raising their hands in jury boxes that oh, that's an absolute runaway, that's an absurd verdict. The hands begin to go down because they get more and more in-depth information. And so let me give you, let me try to give you some of what the judge said and some of his analysis. And 
I haven't said it already, and I haven't, uh, we've had one wonderful caller, and I, I do mean that sincerely, even though I lost my cool. And, and, and for that, I do apologize. Um, give us a call at 340-1590 on this or another topic. And if you call on this topic and you disagree with me, I promise, I promise, I will try to hold my, my emotions to a reasonable level. <laughs> hey, should I call you because I'm uh, planning on suing McDonald's because I can't get my vanilla shakes anymore because they're having a fight with their milkshake company? You want to know, you're, not only can't you get your vanilla shakes anymore from McDonald's, they're having a fight with their company. Uh, we're unable to get our two favorite chocolate desserts at Longhorn because they're having problems with their distributors given the current market conditions. And I can also report that for several years now, the Carabas in St. Lucie West does not serve pizza because its pizza oven is broken, why don't they fix it? It costs thousands of dollars to fix the pizza oven. So I can't get my pizza when we go to Carabas. Hey, this is what goes on, folks. Wait a minute. Pizza at an Italian restaurant, you can't get it. because no, not get Not in St. Lucie West. <laughs> oh, my. I got, I got lots of coupons a few years ago because I was absolutely astounded at, at such a situation. <laughs> okay. All right. Judge starts out by explaining, and I'm gonna do a lot of quoting here. Says that the Florida constitution, quote, requires the balancing of one's own rights with the rights of others. And that when considering separation of power, courts may properly consider whether a law was lawfully enacted. Now, by itself, that seems like an unremarkable statement, but recognize that we're talking about balancing your rights with somebody else's rights. This is not a straight issue of what, what, what do you have the right to do? This is not free speech. This is seriously life and death, balancing your right with other people's rights. The, gov the governor, the, the judge continued, quote, a governor's executive order must be based on authority granted by the constitution or the legislature. He also went on to say that the executive order at issue provided that, quote, local school districts could not adopt a face mask mandate unless it allowed a parental opt-out, end quote. And he explained, the judge, the executive order has two functions. One, prohibit mask mandates by public schools that do not have a parental opt-out, and two, enforce this policy by letting the by using the parents bill of rights a separate statute the court says that quote the executive order has acted to threaten and impose sanctions on school districts if they do not comply and quote well, we know that's true and it's actually happening we'll talk about that in a moment and the judge refers to a Florida Supreme Court decision from the prior year, the first year of COVID. Remember, I, we probably had the same discussion a year ago when all this started. And so the judge mentioned the decision last year of the Florida Supreme Court that held in another school mask case that quote, Whatever the outcome, the choice of how to deliver education to students remains with Florida's school boards, end quote. That's the so-called home rule that Greg had just mentioned. The Constitution specifies 
the right of local school boards to assess the conditions within their locality. Therefore, the judge concluded, a one size fits all policy for students' health and safety as dictated by Tallahassee seems to run contrary to Article 9, Section 4B of the Florida Constitution, end quote. And that is the right of each student to have a safe, healthy public school education. Now, of course, we have to deal with the Parents' Bill of Rights. This is not an insignificant statute. It's not a bad statute. Matter of fact, I think it's a pretty good statute. It's the manner in which it was used, or shall I say abused, that is the problem from my perspective. The court says that the Parents' Bill of Rights does not save the governor's executive order. It does not say, this, this is me saying it, it does not say what he says it says. This is another politician saying that something says something and it doesn't say it. Why? Because 99 and a half percent of us are not going to go back to the source document to check it. And you know, the fact checkers that CNN has are, are not here on the ground. So whether or not that thing is ever fact checked is questionable. Here it was because we had litigation. Now, the relevant provision of the Parents' Bill of Rights, listen carefully, really. The relevant provision states, quote, no governmental entity may infringe on the fundamental rights of a parent to direct the upbringing, education, health care, and mental health of his or her minor child. So let's stop there. Anybody really disagree with that? Raise your hands in your own cars or rooms or raise your hands if you disagree with that. I don't disagree with that. That's what this governor says, the Parents' Bill of Rights says, and to that extent, he's telling the truth. He's just not reading the rest of the sentence. Now, this is a trick that lawyers learn. I learned that when I get a, a brief or a memorandum from another lawyer that quotes cases, I go to those cases and I look at the paragraph before and after that quote, and I see if it changes the intent of the quote or if there are other words that actually literally change the meaning. And when I catch lawyers pulling this unethical stunt, I call them out in my own memorandum to the court. If I find something that is against me, I'll deal with it. I may deal with it successfully or unsuccessfully, but I'll deal with it. I'm not going to manipulate a quote. Anyway, the rest of the quote in the Parents' Bill of Rights says, Remember the parent's fundamental right to direct, blah, 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 their, his or her minor child, without demonstrating, in other words, the parents have this right, without demonstrating that such action is reasonable and necessary to achieve a compelling state interest, and that such action is narrowly tailored and is not otherwise served by a less restrictive means. Now, that is a mouthful. That encompasses basically all three years of law school. All right. You know, sometimes you've got to decipher individual words and phrases because they have meanings, constitutional meanings. So I'm not going to go into all that. This isn't the master class. But what are the words that are really trigger phrases? Okay, the government cannot do this. You, as a parent, have the right to do something. The government cannot do it unless. 
demonstrating that such action is reasonable and necessary. Reasonable and necessary has been interpreted by state courts and federal courts and by the Supreme Court. Reasonable and necessary to achieve a compelling state interest that has been litigated ad nauseum. What is a compelling state interest? And it's also been opined by the Florida, but not by the Florida, by the United States Supreme Court. Compelling state interest and that such action is narrowly tailored, narrowly tailored, another phrase that has meaning, it's been litigated over and over and over, it has a clear meaning, narrowly tailored and, oh my God, and, is not otherwise served by a less restrictive means. So, you as a government can't do something just because it's reasonable and necessary. You can't do it just because it's reasonable and necessary to achieve a compelling state interest. You have to do it because it's reasonable and necessary to achieve a compelling state interest and that you have designed the action to be narrowly tailored and that there is no less restrictive way you could do it. That is the burden of the government if they want to take away from the parent these inherent rights. That's a high burden. Now, Governor DeSantis thinks that you know, the local school districts are just robbing parents of their inherent constitutional rights. No, 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 no. Not if those local school districts had a reasonable and necessary purpose, and it was a compelling state interest. The interest, the action it took was narrowly tailored, and there was no less restrictive means. So quickly, because I only have five minutes. If you're not going to require full masking, how do you protect any of the students in the, in, in the school? Can you do it by requiring 90% masking? No. There's only one way. Come on. It's full masking. And that's why some of these school districts that did not get parental opt-out are able to do this. So the judge concludes after analyzing this, Defendants are relying on the first portion that prohibits infringement on parents' rights, but ignoring the remaining portion, which provides an infringement may occur if the action is reasonable and necessary, et cetera, et cetera. And then the judge concludes, based upon all that analysis, quote, there is no prohibition in the Parents' Bill of Rights against schools adopting mandatory face mask policies without a parental opt-out, so long as the policy is reasonable and otherwise complies with the provisions of the statute. And then the kicker, the judge says, the state, the statute does not support a statewide order or action interfering with the constitutionally provided authority of local school districts to provide for the safety and health of children based upon the unique facts on the ground in a particular county. Now, since I don't have the time, I won't go through the rest of the quotes, but I'm gonna quickly try to do, it, to do what they call spread them to you and do them quickly, but not so quickly you can't hear me. School boards are not required to secure permission in advance to adopt a policy. This court issues a permanent injunction and enjoins the defendants from violating the Parents' Bill of Rights. I also enjoin the enjoined defendant from enforcing or attempting to enforce the executive order and its policies, which violate the Parents' Bill of Rights. So the very statute that the governor relies upon, the judge is saying he violated and he's enjoining the violation. So what does the governor do in response? He follows through on his threat. He has now directed 
the State Department of Education to withhold funds from two school districts in the amount that is equivalent to the salaries of the superintendent and every member of the school board. He's done this after the judge issued an injunction. Now remember, he hasn't yet appealed. So there isn't even an automatic stay that has gone into effect. He is doing this. The governor is doing this. While this injunction is in effect, he is disregarding the court's order. He's disregarding the rule of law. He is determined that little Napoleon Trump is he. How can you consciously violate the court's injunction before you even appeal? The governor doesn't give a darn. He wants what he wants. He's going to do what he's going to do. And there's the music. And so you don't get to listen to me be pissed anymore. <laughs> oh, well, I hope you enjoy your weekend. I hope you enjoy the weekend. I hope that if you're not, you get vaccinated. And they're readily available now. And at least wear the mask. Um, protect yourself. Protect your family. Protect us all. We've got to put an end to this thing. Thank you. And um, I will talk to you next Friday. Hopefully not on this topic anymore. And this is Stuart Address for Ask a Lawyer. Have a wonderful time. That's Galoya right here on WPSL, Port St. Lucie, talking the Treasure Coast, webcaster to the world. On Alexa, Google Home, and tune in worldwide.